Werewolves. The word conjures images in the mind of Hollywood horror films featuring cursed men who, when exposed to the full moon, transformed into monstrous wolf-like creatures that stalked the night in search of human prey. Tales of shapeshifters, men who could transform into animals or animal-like creatures, are found in Native American mythology and legends of the werewolf are found in Greek and European folklore. Surely such a thing cannot exist in the real world. The very thought at first seems absurd, and yet, the stuff of legends and lore sometimes have origins in reality. 1989, in America's heartland, inexplicable events began to manifest themselves, and what was once only legend was brought into terrifying reality. Sightings of a bizarre monster were being reported, mostly centered near Bray Road in the town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. What is the Beast of Bray Road? Just outside the realm of the mundane, is a universe of mysteries beyond comprehension. A doorway of discovery is opened for the few willing souls who wish to perceive it and take a leap into the great unknown. This is the show hosted by two such willing explorers, willing to sail the uncharted seas of the unexplained. And now, the Lewis and Clark of the supernatural, the Buck and Tweaky of the bizarre, the Punch and John of mystery, this is Jason and Steve's Unconventional. Hello and welcome to another edition of Unconventional, The Beast of Bray Road. Sometime between September or October of 1989, a dairy farmer from Elkhorn named Scott Bray reported seeing a strange looking dog in his pasture near Bray Road. He said that the beast was larger and taller than a German Shepherd, had pointed ears, long gray and black hair. It was very heavy set in the front with a really strong chest. And he followed this this thing to a large pile of rocks, but the creature had vanished. And it left behind huge footprints which disappeared into the grass of his pasture. There's another guy, Russell Guest of Elkhorn, also reported seeing the creature around the same time as the Scott Bray sighting. He was about a block or so away from an overgrown area when he heard a rustling of bushes and weeds. And he looked up and saw this creature come out of the thicket. It was standing on its hind feet and it took a few uh, wobbly steps forward, wobbly is how he described it, before um, he began to run away. Uh, Russell ran away, not the beast. He looked back to see that the creature was now on all fours, but it didn't chase him. After a short distance, it wandered off in the direction of Bray Road, and Russell Guest said that the creature was much bigger than a German Shepherd and was covered with black and grayish hair and while it was standing upright, he estimated, estimated it was about five feet tall. It had an oversized uh, dog-like or wolf-like head with a big neck and wide shoulders. It was mostly like a dog, according to Guest, and he thought that it was some sort of dog-wolf hybrid. Now, the first that was publicly reported was on Halloween Day, October 31st, 1999. A young woman named Doristine Gibson from nearby Elkhorn was driving along Bray Road near Delavan, and she neared the intersection of Hospital Road and leaned over to change the station on her radio when she felt her right tire jump off the ground like she hit something. So she stops the car and got out to look at it, see what the heck it was. She saw nothing behind her car, she started looking around, and it was, it was dark of course, this is nighttime. I, did, I don't think I mentioned that. This was nighttime. So she's looking around in the dark, and she sees this huge, hairy form uh, running toward her from about 50 feet away on the road. It's running toward her. She said it was really bulky, and it looked like the body of a man who works out a lot with weights. So naturally, she was uh, freaking out at this point, and she described it as having heavy feet sounds. She ran back to the car, she jumped in and was at a, trying to drive away when this thing jumped on her trunk and it had been raining so the trunk was wet and this thing slid off and hit the pavement. Oh man, this sounds so much like some cheesy horror movie. Yeah, everything except for the car not starting. All she needed starting. was like the car stalling and her fumbling for her keys. Right, right, the car doesn't start. Well, it actually started. Tripping. And then the hook is caught in the door handle. Right, right, right. Then they, they find a claw, and then the, uh, the, town, uh, the town zoologist studies it and finds that it's uh, of no known species. But, but then he gets eaten in the middle of the night. Right. But that's not what happened here. The car was wet, 
It fell off. Now this part I don't understand. This part is one of those weird uh, little quirky things that I have no explanation. Maybe you ha have read other accounts of this particular sighting and you can explain yeah, it. Actually, this but... is kind of cool. We both did uh, different research this week and we're, we're, we haven't seen each other's notes, so this should be interesting. Oh, good, because maybe you can and help elaborate. Expect fist fights after the show. Yeah. I was going to say something about fisting after the show, but no. no. Okay, Doris Dean returned to the site later on in the evening with a young girl that she was taking out trick-or-treating. Now, that's the part I understand. Why the hell would you go back to the site and bring a kid? Uh, yeah. I mean, you'd think you wouldn't want to go anywhere. Why not? I, I just would think that you wouldn't want to go anywhere near there. But I mean, that... At least with the kid, you got somebody you know you can run faster than. Well, <laughs> I, I, I guess that's some kind of warped just logic. Just toss the child out like an orger. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a distraction uh, that she was tr she took the kid out trick-or-treating and, and they were near the same area on the road and she saw this large form on the side of the road and when she saw it moving she ordered the kid to lock her door and she quickly left the scene now she had no idea what she had seen but she wondered if maybe it was a bear and maybe it was angry because she had now, hit it with her car this is all the Doris Gibson stuff right? Yeah, Doris Dean Gibson. Yeah. She thought maybe it was a bear that was angry because she had hit it with her car. No, that doesn't sound very logical either. I mean, animals don't tend to have vendettas against cars. I hit, I hit a bear. So now it's mad. <laughs> it's going to wait for me and recognize the car. Regardless. I better she... stop and exchange insurance information before it calls <laughs> the cops. Mutual werewolf. She told a neighbor about the encounter the next day and showed her the scratched up car. Now, that's an interesting point there, because, uh, you know, you, yeah, could, you could think... Yeah, but that neighbor's Pat Lister, isn't it? It doesn't say from my notes. It's Pat Lister. I got a whole thing about the interconnectivity of all the uh, witnesses during the 89 to 90 flap. Yeah, I do have some notes on that. Well, that, that would mean that we're basically telling a bunch of tall tales here. Well, not necessarily, because the, uh, the researcher that's written a couple of books on this who was also the first reporter to print anything about it, she, she seems to think that... So Pat Lester was a... Uh, she's a central figure in the uh, the flap incidents between 89 and 92. And she was actually a bus driver for the school. Mm, yeah. And so uh, Godfrey thinks that, that as a bus driver, she heard all these stories from different students and, and took them to the reporter, uh. Godfrey. And that's how she found out about all of them interesting theory there yeah but uh, godfrey insists that lester never tried to influence any of the witnesses well so so she told the reporter and then the reporter went and talked to all these people herself okay and nobody took any polygraphs because there was not no real reason to yeah, right? I mean, you know at that point it's just like haha wolfman roams the the boars or whatever right a typical pattern is that uh, then starts the mocking and then starts the cheesy uh feeble attempts to debunk and you know sandhill crane yada 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 a garden yeah. gnome whatever too my, much my alcohol. favorite debunking at this one is that it was a badger <laughs> that's one hell of a badger man yeah because you know from uh, you know a block away you could easily mistake a badger for being six feet yeah mm -hmm. of course and looking like a man that works out and yeah whatever i the, the uh, i get really annoyed frankly with the uh the usual debunking because it's always so insulting to the intelligence of of anyone involved and anyone even casually looking into this would think that doesn't add up i mean they're just horrible explanations now, people thinking it's a bear i can sort of understand but a, a lot of the witnesses say you know i mean they live out in these areas the wildlife officials in that area say that bears are really really rare and they all just all the witnesses describe it having this wolf head with pointy ears and right. you know a bear a, a dog snout basically. And they they seem to all mention human like body, which just doesn't sound like like a bear to me. And bears occasionally get up on all on hind legs, but they don't typically run around run or after walk around people on their hind legs. Hold the bus. So she said that she showed her neighbor the scratched up car the next day. Now, I thought that was interesting. I don't know if anyone actually sh saw the car being scratched up. Like, was the car scratched up? Because normally some country folk trying to just make up a story. What motivation, I'd, I don't know they would have, but they typically wouldn't want to scratch up their own car. But I don't know if that was really 
substantiated. But as the word spread about this thing, more local people started to step forward with their own stories about this thing, dating back to 1989. Uh, one night in the fall of 1989, 24-year-old bar manager Lorian Andrizzi was rounding a curve on Bray Road, just half a mile from the site of the previous incident, and she saw what she thought was a person kneeling over hunched to the side of the road. She slowed down, she took a closer look at the figure, and this is on the passenger side of her car. She was no more than six feet away from it at the time. Um, this only lasted about 45 seconds. She stated that she clearly saw a beast with grayish brown hair, fangs, and pointed ears. And, and she said, quote, It was using its hands like a person. Yeah, yeah, I think I have, I can get to that in a minute, because she... Oh, sorry. I think so. I know that one of these witnesses said that. Yeah, grayish brown hair. It's interesting that they always say grayish brown or grayish black, so there is definitely a mixed coloring in the fur, which seems to be consistent. They always say the gray part, gray and brown or gray and black. She said, and I quote, His face was long and snouty, like a wolf. End quote. She also noted that even though the car's headlights were pointed... Now, this is something interesting here. So please pay attention. She noted that even though the car's headlights were pointed ahead down the roadway, the creature's eye glowed with a yellowish color, just like an animal's do when reflected in car headlights. But the lights were not shining at the creature. Though Mothman accounts... I'm going to go back to Mothman, because there's a lot of parallels here. Oh yeah, it always goes back to Mothman. It, it does. Mothman count stated the eyes glowed too. Was it Darren Derringer or whatever? Darren, the guy that, that ended up sleeping with his shotgun. He he said that he shone his lights at Mothman and it they lit up like reflectors, but they kept doing it even when he wasn't shining his okay. light on. We just can't help but see parallels between these two yeah. cases. And you'll see more as this unfolds. Oh absolutely. So she claimed that this thing's eyes were glowing under their own power, which is really weird. And like Doris Gibson she also saw how wide and powerful the creature's chest and body was. She went on to add that the arms of the beast were rather strange. They were jointed as a man's, and it seemed to be holding food with its palms upward. Um, that's not like any animal she had ever heard of. And yeah, definitely not like a bear. Totally not characteristic of a bear at all. The arms were muscular, quote, like a man who had worked out a little bit, end quote. That's kind of a funny quote. He worked out a little. You know, he wasn't totally cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was in the gym maybe an hour a week or so. He was, he was all right. And the creature seemed to have human-like fingers with claws on the ends. Okay, see, fingers, not bare. Not at all. They have paws. They have stubby little claws on their paws. They don't look like anything like fingers. I'm not thinking this could be a bear. She did not notice any sort of tail, but she did say that its back legs were behind it like a person would be if kneeling. Again, totally uncharacteristic of a bear or any animal's similar four-legged animals that I can think of. She later stated in an interview that the creature, quote, appeared to be so human-like that it was scary, end quote. Her own answer to what she had seen was that it had been a, quote, freak of nature, end quote. She had no idea what, I could ha what it could have been until she saw a book at the library that had an illustration of a werewolf in it. It so closely resembled what she had seen on Bray Road that her, quote, eyes popped out, end quote, of her head. Upon hearing Doris Gibson's sighting report, Indrizzi, Indrizzi contacted the Lakeland Animal Shelter, and her mom contacted a local newspaper writer named Linda Godfrey. She hoped that publicity would encourage other people who have seen this thing to come forward with their own accounts. The story mm -hmm. that followed was published on December 29, 1991. And, and it's two years later. So Linda Godfrey, the, the reporter that wrote the account of it, she had heard these stories for about two years before she published anything. Yeah, the story that followed was published in December 29th, 1991. And it contained basic information about the Gibson and Endrizzi sightings. Um, they used pseudonyms for the two women in those articles. It also included some brief summaries of other sightings. It mentioned that chickens had been stolen and that another family who lived near Bray Road had seen the creature as well. Karen Bowie, who actually lived along Bowers Road, stated that the 11-year-old daughter, Heather, had seen... Oh, yeah, this is a whole different story here. Yeah, her 11-year-old daughter. Sorry, not the 11-year-old daughter. <laughs> there are other 11-year-old daughters in, in that town. It's not that small. Her 11-year-old daughter had seen the creature back in 1989. She had been playing outside. 
her daughter had, and thought it was a giant dog. Until it stood up, then she reconsidered. She mentioned the weird shape of its back legs, which bent backward as a human's rather than forward as a normal canine's do. She also commented on its extreme speed. John Frederickson, the county humane officer, told the reporter that he thought it was just a coyote. But he admitted there were a lot of people who believed that they had seen something odd. He confessed he wasn't really sure what to think about it. Now, Frederickson's interesting because he comes up a lot throughout this whole thing. The major media outlets, of course, started to pick up on this now. And what unfortunately usually happens, the witnesses started getting ridiculed and laughed at by the locals. Hey, too much moonshine, blah, 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 ha, ha. Werewolf signs were planted in front yards. People had werewolf parties. Uh, joking went on even at, even at her own work. People were joking about it, embarrassing her. Werewolf T-shirts were sold. Tourists visited Bray Road, hoping to see the uh, this werewolf for themselves. As time went by, the excitement died down, and the patience of the townspeople was running really low. So, despite all of the joking, there was an underlying fear in Delavan and, El- and in Elkhorn that something real was happening and that now people were starting to see some more bizarre stuff the summer before the werewolf had been reported a dozen or so animals had been dumped in a ditch along nearby willow road john frederickson that humane officer again from delavan said he believed several of the animals had been used as sacrifices for satanic cults while Lynn Police Chief James Jensen dismissed this idea in June 91, Frederickson insisted that officials were missing the point. According to the officer, some of the animals had ropes tied around their back legs and their throats were slit. Some were decapitated and others were dismembered in various ways. Nice. The most recently killed animal was a dog that had its chest cavity split open and its heart removed. Uh, several of the animals matched descriptions of recently missing pets. The mutilated carcasses were almost immediately covered up. Literally covered up. The site was quickly bulldozed, ending Frederickson's investigation. But it did not end the rumors that followed. Other reports began to reach Frederickson that summer. There were reports of phony, humane officers looking for stray dogs. One involved an unidentified man in a black uniform driving a large black car. Hmm, here we go. What does that sound like? who attempted to intimidate a child who was home alone into giving up his black Labrador retriever. So now we've got animal mutilations and what actually could be a man in black going on here. Yeah, at that same time, though, Frederickson also reported that other people were posing as humane officers out looking for stray dogs. Right. So it's just sound like some kind of weird... And this uh, this all gets with so Linda um, Godfrey did the uh, initial investigation and reporting, and she she was completely under the impression that this was all just you know normal cryptid, undiscovered animal type stuff. And then later, this guy Todd Roll came around from the uh, Wasu Paranormal Research Society, and the more he began looking into it, the more he thought there was an occult connection. Oh, okay. Yeah, so in all the sightings that Linda reported, three of the times the beast had been spotted either in or near a graveyard. And then on the day after Halloween of the first sightings, some of the graves had uh, wax drippings all over the tombstones. Yeah, which is typical of satanic rituals. Dripping, uh, lighting candles on And then Frederickson actually pointed uh, Mr. Roll out to a house where... um, uh, they had found like piles of slaughtered animals basically back in the June of 91. Yeah, it's like and a, quarter mile, when, a quarter mile off of Bay Road, that abandoned house. Exactly, exactly. And when Roll uh, found the owner and interviewed him, the owner uh, said that the animals were used in religious ceremonies. Yeah, part of, quote, my religion, end quote, is what I heard. And so now we have the occult, we have glowing eyes, we have strange creature that just shows up suddenly and we have men in black driving around and it's like a repeat of the mothman without the wings and there were a few things we overlooked in our mothman account which i came upon later but they're, they're actually ufos were really heavy in the mothman case much heavier than i had originally thought but also there was 
some UFO stuff involved in this one, which we will get to. So, yeah, we've got the animal sacrifices going on. Weird satanic ritual evidence. Uh, now, around Christmas 1990, Heather Bowie uh, had her previously mentioned encounter. She had no idea that she had seen the same thing as Doris Gibson until she'd heard the young woman talking about it on the school bus. Yeah, no, this is what you had mentioned. And how the driver, Pat Lis Lester, who happened to be Andrizzi's mom, listened to the girl's story and passed it on to Linda Godfrey. Then the reporter contacted Karen Bowie, but it could be Bowie. Probably is Bowie. Also a school bus driver. And mentioned the sighting in the newspaper. Heather elaborated on the encounter to Scarlett Sankey. And here, this is the other sighting. Um, I want to make sure. Yeah. This sighting occurred around 4.30 p.m. As Heather and several friends were returning home from sledding near Loveland Road. Which is about a mile and a half southeast of the intersection of Bray and Hospital Roads. They happened to look up and saw what appeared to be a large dog walking along the creek in snow covered in a snow covered cornfield. Heather estimated that it, it was about a block away from them. Thinking it was a dog, the children began calling to it. Now this is the the, the account you were mentioning earlier. And then it, it looked at him and stood up, which always freaks out the witnesses, naturally, and they described it as being covered with quote silverfish like brownish end quote hair. The beast took four awkward steps in their direction and then dropped down on all fours and began to run towards them in what Heather later described as being a bigger leap than dogs run. It followed the group about halfway to the Bowie home before it ran off in another direction. That's another interesting thing that strikes me is that this thing always conveniently doesn't get to the people. Have you noticed this? It, it like it has every yeah, opportunity to. I think that's to. weird. It's like everybody's afraid of it, but it does nothing. It's exactly like Mothman. Exactly. It chases them or appears to come at them, but just never manages to ever get them, which makes no sense. If this was an actual animal, it would easily catch at least a couple of these people. It had ample opportunity, and it never does, which to me is odd, highly odd. So in March of 1990... An Elkhorn dairy farmer named Mike Etten spotted something unusual along Bray Road one early morning around 2 a.m. And he had this guy actually admitted to have been drinking, which is refreshingly different. Well, yeah, it also uh, reinforces your credibility. Well, yeah, you know, it, in a way, it's, it's kind of works both ways to, to be admitting you're drinking kind of shows it, that you are an honest guy. It's one of those things. I mean, like, if you really wanted people to believe in Mothman, why would you say crazy shit like, you know, it was weeping on the roof and stuff like that? Right. And and, and, and we don't know how much he was drinking, and, you know, just because you're dr drinking doesn't mean everything you see is not real. So in the moonlight, um, this guy saw a dark-haired creature that was bigger than a dog, just a short distance from the hospital road intersection. Whatever the creature was, it was sitting, quote, like a raccoon sits, end quote, using its front paws to hold on to something that it was eating. As he passed by it, the creature, it lifted its head and looked at him. Eh, at that point, yeah, I'd be running. Really fast. Drunk or not, I would not want to be around. But he described the head as being thick and wide with snout that was with a snout that was not as long as a dog's. The body was covered with dark, thick hair, and its legs were big and thick. Not being able to identify the animal, Etten assumed it was a bear. However, when the other sightings of the Bray Road Beast were made public in 1991, he had some serious doubts. Uh, one of the last reported encounters with the creature occurred in early February 1992. It happened around 10.30 p.m. on Highway H, about six miles southwest of the Bray and Hospital Road's intersection. A young woman named... Let me stop for a moment. This, this cemetery, you, you were mentioning a lot of cemeteries. I haven't seen a map, but is there a cemetery, like, right off of Bray Road? Did, did I miss yeah, that? It's supposed to be in the area from what I from what I hear. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a map. Because they keep, they keep mentioning Bray and Hospital Roads intersection. Yeah, that's, that's where all the heavy activity occurs. Which, again, doesn't sound typical of an animal's roam. Um, hunting animals roam around. They don't stay in one really limited area. It just seems odd. Like, especially bears, they tend to avoid human habitations. They only come out when their own habitat is being infringed upon. But the young woman named Tammy Bray worked for a retirement home, was driving along when a large dog-like animal, which is what they always say, dog-like, crossed the road in front of her. 
She braked and slid to a stop at the same moment as the creature turned to look at her. She described it as having a broad chest, which is typical of everyone else, pointed ears, typical again, covered with matted brown and black fur. So she's spot on with all the other descriptions. The narrow nose, thick neck, and gleaming yellow eyes convinced her that she wasn't looking at Lassie. Finally, it continued to cross the road, totally nonplussed by this woman. She mentioned that it walked strong in front, more slouchy, sloppy-like in the rear. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's wacky. It's like the midgets in a bear costume or something. Yeah, bears like it sloppy in the rear. So no! Tammy drove home and told her husband, <laughs> Scott Bray, what she had seen. They knew it had to be the same thing he had seen in the pasture earlier. So husband and wife see it. At yeah, I was times. just going to mention that Scott Bray had been one of the original people to spot this thing early on. Yeah. So, strong in front, slouchy, sloppy-like in the rear, which is not characteristic of wolves at all. They walk the same on all four. Neither is it characteristic of a bear. That would, that sounds odd too. It really, this thing sounds very top-heavy, like it's got this huge, almost like a gorilla's build, where it can stand up but often goes on all fours and that the which surprisingly is what a lot of people say when they see that gable film oh that it we should mention there is a, a film called the gable film and it the background on it is very cryptic and weird it was supposed no, it's dodgy is it well it's, it was it's it, straight up dodgy it was supposed to have been bought at a at an estate sale and then it's oh to... let's hold off on that we'll get to all that good stuff okay yeah, but it's, it's out there. There's supposed footage of this creature coming through uh, some light woods. And this is actually daylight, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, most of the sightings of this creature are at night, but there are a few that are during the day. Right. So... Now, so, this is where... Well, this is where other weirdness starts happening. I mean, other stuff can be mentioned. There is actually a UFO report. Oh, yeah, I was just going to get to that. So now that the flap's winding down, there's this one last thing that happens. Right. Um, in January of 1992, just as all this hoopla was dying down, a local reputable businessman, that's quotes, I'm not, it's not my opinion. You know, he could be like a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman for all I know. Or the town drunk, I don't know. She's, he's called a reputable businessman by Linda Godfrey. He told her that he had seen two bright lights emitting sparks and moving erratically across the sky above Delavan. Later that spring, four or five horses that were pastured near Elkhorn were found with their throats slashed. John Fredrickson, who investigated, was quoted as saying that, quote, they were almost surgical type wounds, end quote. And then after that, everything died down and came to an apparent end. So, yeah, yeah, so this John Fredrickson's interesting. He, he's the guy that the reporter first interviewed about the creature when she began getting serious about it. And he actually had a folder called Werewolf with about six um, information cards filled out from people that had witnessed this thing. Whoa. He's also the guy that told Todd Rawl about the uh, house with the, the uh, piles of slaughtered animals. Mm -hmm. And... Now he's the guy that goes out and investigates these five dead horses with their throats slashed. So he, he keeps popping up again and again because he's the county humane officer. It, this is so like some some 80s straight to video movie. Yeah, yeah. He's like the the you know the guy that wants to get to the real truth. He's like the cold check, the night stalker. Yeah, he actually got into some arguments with the police over the whole slaughtered occult animal thing. Oh, really? Yeah, because they wanted to just dismiss the whole thing, but he was the one that pointed out that they had rope marks around their feet and had been slit open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then the police just pretty much bulldozed all the uh, piles of animals, I guess. Oh, I see. I, I missed that, that it was the police. Okay. And then he was actually arguing with the police. He wanted to investigate further. Yeah, you'd think they... I guess the cops in that area have just better things to do, like catch speeders and eat donuts. And worship oh. Satan. <laughs> or <laughs> was it the police? Yeah, dude. That, now that's totally made for video movie. There, <laughs> totally. it turns out that it's the cops. 
and they're all in on it. He like bursts in on this dark room, and they've all got robes. They're like, get them, boys! And they pull out their daggers, and there's this kung fu battle to the death. Oh, I could totally see it. And then Linda Godfrey is like all naked on some altar, and they're getting ready to sacrifice her. <laughs> oh my god. Just get some ninjas in there, and some... Oh, and that sounds like a good movie. God, Chuck Norris could be uh, this uh, investigator. What's his name again? Henriksen? Or, that's the uh, county humane officer, yeah. John Hen or John Fredrickson. Fredrickson. I'm, I'm so bad with names. Yeah, that would be awesome. You know, they, they did actually make a movie of this, and I heard it was absolutely craptastic, and it did go straight to video. So, not far from yeah, the truth. They had the, the wolfman killing people and stuff. No, none of which has been reported yet. I heard the movie sucked immensely, and that witnesses thought it was just completely idiotic and insulting to what really happened. It had, it had nothing to do with it. It was just a cheap, you know, cash in on the name, basically, to do a werewolf movie. It, it didn't even try to actually be even slightly similar to the actual event at all. It was just a stupid werewolf movie. Although, the, like I said, the plot of this real thing almost sounds like it could be a stupid movie. But reality can be weirder than fiction. So... That, that leaves us with pretty much the end of this thing. Well, that's just that flap, because there's an, flap. another flap going on right now. Oh, there well, is, right now. Yeah, well, I, I think because of the publicity, more people are coming forward with stuff they'd seen previously. But there are a couple of new sightings that are really interesting. Uh, the, the key one that I think is most interesting is that Steven Kruger guy. Hmm. Tell me about this guy, because yeah, I, I only knew about the, the main flap that okay, everybody so knows about. Steve Kruger is a public employee of that county, and he's paid to go around picking up roadkill. Awesome job if I've ever heard of one. Yeah. Where do I sign up? Yeah, totally. Come on, we getting vittles tonight. Yeehaw! Got me some skunk. Anyway, so November 8th, 2006, at about 1.30 in the morning, he's driving around randomly because he's already picked up all the stuff that's been reported. So he just drives around looking for other roadkill to, to clear out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do recall this one now. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I won't yeah. steal your thunder. He's actually one of the guys I think they interviewed in the Hannity show. Oh, yeah. Sean Hannity. Anyway, so this, he's yeah. in his truck, and he stops in the Bray Road area. And uh, he, because he spotted a small deer carcass off the side of the road. So he gets out and he puts up this aluminum ramp to the back of his truck. And he, you know, with some difficulty shoves this carcass up into the back of the truck. He then truck. hops into the front and he turns on the dome light and he has like a blinker on the top of the vehicle because that's, you know, regulations for their apartment. So he's in the truck. There's loud music playing and he's filling out the paperwork. Leonard goes, Skinner, no doubt. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, he's filling out the paperwork because anytime you have a government job, I mean, probably like nine tenths of it are filling out one oh, stupid form or another. Totally, yeah. Anyway, he he feels the truck jiggle and he thinks, you know, oh, it's just like wind coming off the mountains or I don't know, off the cows. I don't know what the hell's in Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, so he thinks nothing of it. And he he's still working on his paperwork when the truck jiggles again, but stronger. So now he knows it's not just wind. And he actually turns around and looks back to, to the uh, the bed of his truck, and he sees what he describes as like uh, you know kind of a bear shape, but with a wolf head on it. Oh my and god! It's basically digging into this deer carcass. Can you imagine though? Seriously, you're on a dark country road. Oh, I know. It's like Dude, maybe ten feet away. I would six, uh, twelve. I don't know. I, I don't I don't envy any of these witnesses. Not only do you get ridiculed, you get the living crap scared out of you first, then you get ridiculed continue yeah. so so he does basically what i think any sane person would in that situation he drives the hell out of there oh, yeah. and Aftercraft. when he's leaving he hears the aluminum ramps that he put up on the back of his truck he hears them fall off and hit the road oh and he okay. takes off so fast that the deer ends up sliding out of the truck as well okay I that didn't... or it was helped by the beast or something i didn't get so that he drives anything. down um I, I forget exactly how long but like probably no more than five minutes worth of driving and stops to, to collect his nerves and you know he realizes that oh no you know i left the ramp and the deer's gone so he decides that he's gonna go back and at the very minimum get the ramps because you know expensive i guess i wouldn't care if it took you know like half the truck with it i keep driving yeah i'd be like fred flintstoning it 
Oh, have my, my feet out the bottom. I'd probably running. stop in like the next county. Yeah, until the, until the sun came up. I just keep driving. Yeah. So he goes back and he looks for the deer and he looks for the ramps. He can't find either. Which is extremely weird. Yeah, the the ramps disappearing is odd because if it was just a normal cryptid like undiscovered animal, why would it want or even care about the ramps? It wouldn't. It absolutely yeah. wouldn't. So it's it's kind of weird. But but this guy he he's been doing this job for decades, and so he knows what animals look like, and he said he had never seen anything like that ever before. Which is very credible because you got so a guy who knows animals, yeah. Yeah, I, I would tend to believe that. So for the rest of his shift, he drives around debating whether to tell the police or not because he knows what happened to all the people back in the 89 to 92 flap. Right, he doesn't want to be added to the freak list. Oh, totally, totally. Start having werewolf parties on his lawn and what have you. <laughs> How people howling when they walk by? At, at the end of his rationale process, he decides, you know, there's a really big creature out there, and in the interest of, of public safety, I had better tell the police about it. See, that, that's, that guy was a pretty big stud to have that kind of integrity to think, you know what, screw if they laugh at me, I think people might be in danger of this thing. Yeah, and so the police, of course, do exactly what he expected. They title the report as a Yeti sighting and mention Bigfoot a few times in it. Yeti? Yep. Yeti? That's not even... Well, whatever. <laughs> I know yeah. about this well, stuff. I mean, but... the interesting thing about that is is that when he goes in and tells them and they're all joking about it, I mean, that sounds like they have some familiarity with this sort of thing happening. Well, that that's true, too. And they're just used to scoffing at it, because... Yeah, I don't know. know. That's just my conjecture. I mean, I don't. maybe they would start calling it a Yeti the first time anybody came in, but it just it seemed like they were too familiar. Mm -hmm. Well, they would have heard about it. To me, at least. You think they would have heard about it. I mean, that's the first thing normal people do. If they really think they saw some huge, scary, dangerous animal, they're going to call the police. Yeah, that's pretty much all conjecture on our part, but, you know, based on all the stuff that I read, it just sounded like the police were a little bit familiar with people coming in and reporting crap like that. Yeah, I would agree with you totally on that one. And then beyond that, you know, I mean, that, that was just a few years ago. There have been a couple of other really kind of weird and interesting reports. So, you know, obviously whatever flap happened back in 89, 92 w was obviously the big exciting thing. But now there's other people coming forward. And I think one of the more interesting ones are these college kids. One's a medical student. They decide, hey, let's go looking for it. Oh, boy. First mistake. Yeah. I don't know about you, but my spring break, I, I went looking for something else altogether. Yeah, I would not be, yeah. That would be the last thing I'd be hunting for. So anyway, they go out to this this house that that's supposed to be abandoned or whatever around 2.30 in the morning. So these guys were hungry for the wolf. Yeah. Like anyway, 2.30 in the morning, they're sitting there for about a half hour when suddenly all the crickets stop chirping. And these college students are in their car, which, you know, thank God is the one smart thing that they're doing. And yeah. so they, they shine a mag light over on out in the woods, I guess, and they see some sort of like big man shaped creature dodging from tree to tree and they freak out and leave. Dodging from tree. OK, so running around on the ground. Well, which is actually kind of common behavior of this thing. It's like most of the time it doesn't chase after people it like ducks behind something or ducks into cornrows hmm so it's, it's a lot like bigfoot in that regard elusive and stealthy yeah unless it's children then it's thinking hors d'oeuvres all the way totally pizza rolls chow down time but of course it didn't catch them yeah, so these college kids, they drive off and then they stop and they decide well, we didn't really identify what we saw so hey, let's go back and, and uh, see if we can get a really good look at it. Oh, great. Yeah, cute, cheesy 80s horror movie theme music chase, here. Chase, 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 chase. Brave Wolf, Brave Wolf, Brave Wolf, Brave Wolf. So they go back, and they're back at this building again, and something chase, makes chase, the motion chase, sensor chase. lights on the building go off, and it lights up the area. Dude, and, uh, so horror movie. It's totally, totally. And so the driver Alien. is looking out the back of the car he's looking out i guess past all the passengers so what have you 
and he sees what he thinks are like two yellow reflectors because <sighs> you know, out in the country i guess they put them on posts so you don't drive off the road oh yeah yeah they're out there on those fences and on the mailboxes and, and he's and thinking they're reflectors until they blink oh lord and, and then the thing comes out into the light and they oh. can definitely tell it's like some sort of uh wolf man creature walking but the, the interesting thing about this case is that he described this feeling like he knew it meant them harm so it was like radiating malice basically wow now that is significant to me yeah and then they drove off in utter terror and never went back now is this the first and only time you have read of the witnesses describing that tangible fear evil nope. presence there's another one aha uh -huh. continue okay so this other case there's a rail yard worker uh, i don't know what he does i mean if he told me it would probably just you know completely if it's not video game related i want to figure it out Anyway, he there's like this one area that he works in at night a lot, and he's used to just like hanging out in this this uh, intersection of uh, railroads, I guess, waiting for trains to pick him up so he can go do something or other. <laughs> a real winner. Yeah. Unlike the medical students who were. So anyway, he's in this area one night when he gets this really creepy feeling, and he describes it as there being something evil nearby. Uh huh. And he sees a giant dog walk across the tracks. Uh-huh. This is, again, Mothman-esque. Yes, and he says that the dog is so big that the only thing that would explain it would be a bear of some sort. Okay. But the, the, I guess the key point of that was that he had been in this area, you know, working for years and years, and he never, ever felt that way ever until he spotted this thing going across the tracks. And then there's another really, really weird report that I don't even know what to make, you know, heads or tails of. So this this guy says that when he was young and in the Flint, Michigan area, him and his uncle had spotted something on the road that ran off. Mm -hmm. And then when they were making their return trip to whatever the hell they were doing, you know, checking the shine stills or whatever, <laughs> they, they drive by the same yeah. spot again. And the uncle, you know, I, I don't know what these people in the Midwest think, but he pulls out a, a handgun and says, I'm going to go see what it is, youngin. You stay in the car. Finally, somebody with, with a real man solution to yeah, this Chuck bullshit. Yeah, Chuck Norris was riding with him that night. I'll take care of this shit. You stay in the car, boy. So he goes out off the road a bit, and he comes back a little later saying he didn't find what, what they had seen earlier, but there was like a half-eaten deer just off the road. Hmm. Half-eaten. Yeah, and that was that was that guy's only like brush with actually seeing something. But then later, when he was grown up, <laughs> is that a quote? <laughs> no, nah, I'm just imagining being from <laughs> that area. Nah, this this ain't well. You know, this isn't the deep south though. Let's be fair. Oh, it is Wisconsin. Sure. They don't even have accents there, so yeah, they do. They have the well that uh, goofy Sarah Palinish kind of way. Some of them, yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of them, but they're not like yeah, oh, my name's Jethro. They're not like that. <laughs> anyway, this guy grows up and he joins the Navy and he gets stationed in San Diego. Why the hell you would join the Navy when you live in Wisconsin? I, I don't know. Well, you want to get the hell out of Wisconsin. According oh, to, okay, that makes perfect sense. According to the person I know, there's nothing to do in Wisconsin as a young adult or teen other than hang out at Walmart. And then when you get to be an adult, guess what you get to do? Work at Walmart. Oh, man. It this sucks. Sounds like a life for me. Yeah, there's nothing going on in Wisconsin. So he is in the Navy, and he gets stationed in San Diego, and one of his buddies ends up on a deployment for six months out at sea, which, you know, they do routinely. And so when a guy goes out to sea, he usually has buddies check in on his wife and kids and, you know, what have you. Anyway, so one night he gets a panicked phone call from his buddy's wife, and she is just incoherent with, like, fear. So he drives out to her apartment, and he starts talking to her, and she says that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw a wolf man at the end of the bed with glowing eyes. But she was so terrified she couldn't speak or do anything. You could go the route of, well, you're just dreaming. You woke up and from a dream, you know, that's... Yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like a waking dream or night terrors to me. But I just, I think it's interesting that it keeps cropping up in all these different monster uh, cases. And I'm not, you know, I tend to lean toward the paranormal about a lot of these night terror episodes that I that I have looked into and that I've even experienced myself where there's a difference between night terrors and some of these accounts. I'm I'm not convinced that they're all night terrors. 
to be honest. Yeah, and I tend to, to pretty much just suck off whatever scientists say. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a lot more comforting. I'll say that. I'd, be, I'd oh, like to oh, believe yeah. no, that it's trust not. Trust me, comforting is exactly what I need to get to sleep <laughs> at night. See, I, I'm just too much of a grim, grim, uh, open-minded person. I, I no matter how uncomfortable it is, I still want to admit that it's whatever it is. So anyway, that's just conjecture, though. So, yeah. But it did look just like this thing that people have been seeing and. Yeah, the, the location in San Diego is kind of weird, but it's interesting that a guy that had been from that area and then moved somewhere else had, you know, an experience where a friend of his saw the same thing. Right. Exactly. It's it's interesting. Kind of a psychical tie. All right. Should we talk about the Gable films? Yeah, we should mention that, and we should mention oh, the uh, this stuff. Is this is so good? And I gotta get I gotta get my uh, Hui file ready. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you came to the same conclusion I did. So we basically, we, we both did our own research and have our own notes and uh, kind of decided to see what it would be like to meet in the middle on the show. It, it sounds like we came to a lot of the same conclusions, actually. Well, one, so you want to go ahead and describe the uh, Gable film? You might know a little more about it than me. What I know is that it was reportedly obtained at an estate sale and that it's a Super 8 film, supposedly shot in the what in the early 80s or late 70s yeah it looks late 70s to me yeah it very much does because there is a brief moment in the film that they they, this is old there's a a brief few frames in the film where you can see the camera person who looks like a teenage boy in the passenger seat of uh an older car and you see him in the rearview mirror with this camera in the rearview mirror it's very brief but you do see him and then later in this film you're out in an open meadow, it looks like, kind of rolling wild meadow, kind of a slight incline, like a yeah, I'd sloping call hill. It like a light wood, actually. Yeah, there's brambles and shrubs and stuff, and, and deep grass. Lots of thin trees. I mean, we're, we're from the northwest, so we're like used to these thick forests that you can't see, you know, more than ten yards through. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, people can of course YouTube this immediately and see this film for themselves. It's all over YouTube, of course. So this this creature uh, comes running into frame. Uh, uh, Actually, first it's just kind of sitting there for maybe a second or yeah. two. Yeah, and, and at that like point, it's, like it's like it's stalking prey or considering what to do. And much like the uh, Patterson, that's it, Patterson Gimlin. Much like that, it's kind of fuzzy. It's kind of grainy. The camera work isn't very awesome, and you don't get the best look at this thing. But it starts running, loping toward the camera person through the deep grass, kind of down a hill toward the cameraman. And I personally thought a chunk of those frames, when it starts loping, that it just doesn't look right. It doesn't look like a guy in a costume to me. Actually, a lot of people on YouTube agree with you. They think it looks like a gorilla or some other animal moving. Yeah, the movements are just weird. Like, in order to be a guy in a costume running down an incline in deep grass in a costume, you you wouldn't be able to lope like that unless you had massive upper body. It just looks weird to me. It just looks weird. I'm I'm not being biased. I'm not saying I want to believe that film because I don't even think the film is necessary for this case to be legit. But that, it's just weird. Yeah, I I thought it was too brief to really be able to say one way or another. So I, I kind of took it a more skeptical look at it. Like, it's just too brief. It's just too fuzzy. The camera work is just too lame for yeah, me I to agree. buy that it's a creature. It's it's more brief than the Patterson game. And then the too. ending really, really has some troubles. I mean, there's there's uh, they drop the, whoever it is. You know, this thing takes like three lopes and then the camera goes crazy because the guy is like running away or whatever. Supposedly. But he drops the camera and there's bursts of static, which I don't know how a eight millimeter would manage. Well, actually, let me back up. What what I recall is actually there's a few frames before it drops where you see a wolf-like mouth really close yeah. up, and then you see a couple frames of static, which to me looks totally digitally edited in. And of course, yep. uh, static does not occur on film. Well, Hello. Yeah, exactly. The, the problem I have is with the camera being in the mouth of the creature, I mean, even Super 8 requires a lot of light to pick up any image at all. 
Well, depending on the film speed. I actually owned a, a Super 8 film camera, and I used it in up until the mid-80s even to do animation work and a few home movies things. And oh, you, okay. There, there I, is, you know, I could be wrong about that. It just it seemed weird to me that it would have such a nice shot of the teeth around the camera. No, it is possible because it, it was decent okay. daylight. Okay. But to me, it looked spliced in, and the, and the static just blew it for me. Yeah, the static, the static is all wrong. Now, there's there's a couple of different versions of this. There are versions that just show the uh, creature sitting there, but then there are longer versions that actually show a lot of boring detail. Guys driving around on uh, snowmobiles and in their pickup truck, and you know, really, really dull. Okay. So, but the, the origin of it, who shot it, the fact that nobody knows All who right. shot it seems really questionable. Oh no, this is this gets good. So let's start. We go back to 1987, April 1st. Steve Cook, a local DJ on WTCM, releases a song called "The Legend" about a Wisconsin werewolf. Mm-hmm. April 1st, he tries to push it off as a real thing. And we all know what April 1st is. Exactly. Anyway, this same Steve Cook has broadcast ghost stories that he personally writes himself every year on Halloween since 1987. All of these are fictional. Mm -hmm. So we get this whole communion angle going on now with Whitley Stryber. Right, right. A guy who's known for writing fiction. Exactly. In the same genre, even. Yep. So basically, after Stephen Cook uh, releases this song, The Legend, on April 1st, he starts getting phone calls at the station, people reporting that they had seen this thing, even though the whole thing was a hoax. Well, yeah, it was a hoax to begin with. Now we fast forward to 2007. Steve Cook suddenly ends up in possession of this film that he got from an estate sale. Oh, okay. So the very guy that started the whole modern incarnation of the Wolfman in Wisconsin suddenly has in his possession this this tape of a werewolf-like beast. That's, uh, yeah, that's it's so... a little bit too coincidental. Oh, it gets better, though. Yeah, that's so questionable it would make me... That, that really casts a lot of doubt on this thing. Enter in the people that own the copyright to the Gable film. Mind Stage Productions... If you look at any of the YouTube videos, they say Mind Stage Productions in the bottom right-hand corner uh-huh. because they own the copyright of it. Now, if it was really, you know, just some footage that had found in a state sale, whoever bought it would have the copyright, or it could be public domain if they wanted. Right. And I'm sure lawyers could probably call us and tell us what complete idiots we are. Feel free. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was saying, feel free to call us and tell us what idiots we are. Yeah, if you can find our number, yeah. you just move to rank on us. Yeah, that should be available in the future, though. Near future, I would hope, for this project. Okay, so this Mind Stage Productions, when you go to their website, not only do they have iTunes versions of all those stories that Steve Cook uh, broadcast from uh, WTCM Radio, but they also have... Uh, some stuff related to the Beast of Bray Road as well. Uh Uh-huh. And they also have experience with actors creating stuff for animatronics, um, making commercials, making other video productions. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that stuff. Yeah, it, it all turns out to be incredibly, incredibly cheesy. Now, Linda Godfrey, the uh, reporter that first reported this and the lady that wrote the two books on this, she is like friends with Steve Cook and she pretty much feels that it wouldn't be in his character to make this stuff up. Oh, well then that's a little bit more to the other side. And I, but, I don't know. think it's enough. Dude, for me, I, I'm pretty... Uh, Steve and myself are both pretty well versed in video and editing. We've done a fair amount. Steve's even been to school for it. And I've looked at a lot of film. I've I've worked with Super 8 film and the the frame by frame analysis, the 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 mouth shot in the film of the creature's mouth, the the static really killed it for me cuz that looked like this is somebody trying to contrive something to look hand shot and it's somebody who's ignorant enough to think that static occurs in a super 8 film camera and that pretty much blew it for me so the costume looking 
a little bit compelling, looking a little realistic for a few frames as it jumps down isn't enough to compensate for all the other negatives. Yeah. And well, I actually, would... okay, so Lauren Coleman, he's the guy that wrote the more, more coherent book on Mothman. Um, on his website, Cryptomundo, and I gotta say, I love that name. It so it's reminds awesome. me of the Fonz. Cryptomundo. <laughs> hey, Richie, um, this thing's Cryptomundo. <laughs> hey. <laughs> His take on the thing well, from you know, the very beginning was that it. Fonzie it, was uh, from. I gotta say, Fonzie was from. They were in Wisconsin too. Just, just a uh, oh, Milwaukee incidents. Yeah, Milwaukee. Okay, go ahead. Uh, he, his take on the thing was that it felt like a hoax. Yeah, you know. Okay, my personal feeling after all that information and, like I mentioned, the technical aspects, a little clearly spliced in crap. Added to what you've said, I'm gonna say this film needs to be put into the <laughs> Hui Fi. Nice. Bye bye. Crapola. BS. Not oh, but it gets better. It doesn't end there. Oh yeah? Yeah, there's a second Gable film too. Oh no. <laughs> the Gable film part two. Yes. On yes. Fox. This is somebody with a hand uh camcorder was well, Jonathan is Jonathan Frakes gonna host a, a Fox <laughs> special about it because at that point I know it's about as fi- as, as factual as Him the two fairy start dissecting the uh, wolfman <laughs> themselves well we've got it in, inside with Worf though because he does our show intro oh yeah that's true so he wouldn't he wouldn't lower himself to such and he could kick my ass if we ever met totally Jonathan Frakes I'm not too worried about nah not anymore Anymore. Okay, so on this second film, it's filmed with a camcorder, and the opening shot is showing a uh, one of the old projectors that you use to show Super 8 film with. Mm-hmm. And then the camera pans to the screen, so you don't even get to see a direct c- transfer of the Super 8 to video. It's a, a taping of them playing it on a screen. Oh, that sounds so lame. And it, does it suddenly seeg to a really clear, obvious digital video with fake no, film effects no, laid it's... over it? Or is it actually <laughs> shot off of a wall the whole time? It's shot off the wall the whole time okay. to mask what is probably the very worst police evidence film I've ever seen in my life. Well, who, who would bother to tape it off of the wall? It makes no sense whatsoever. Other than to so hide anyway, the what's on the uh, the wall that they're showing is basically a police investigation scene where they have a cop in one of the old style uniforms with a pad of paper and notes that you can't see because it's so washed out. Mm-hmm. And they point out some stuff and then they go to this tarp and lift it and it's basically what looks to be the person that had been working on the truck in the first film, but there's only half a body and there's entrails spilled out all over the place. Oh. <laughs> what a crock of And there are serious turd. problems with it. Now, the uh, body and is, is they claim that it had been dragged off the road because the person that filmed it was obviously on the road. I mean, they get out of their truck when they're filming the, the creature loping at them. Okay. So this body's been dragged off the road. The legs are completely missing. There's entrails all spilled out everywhere. There's no blood on the upper torso. There's no drag marks. There's no dirt. It just looks like a bot, you know, half body with entrails. Oh, boy, that sounds really cheesy. And then a few yards away is the camera, which uh-huh. somehow also got dragged off into the woods. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Because when you drop a camera on a wild beast, it attacks you and rips you in half. It picks up the camera and takes it, too. Yeah, so for this portion, I mean, stupid. I know that we try not to, to too heavily say one way or another, but yeah, uh, definitely hopes. Yeah, that's a bunch of crap. Now, some of the explanations, some of the uh, debunk attempts here, and I'm going to call them attempts because I think they suck. Oh, yeah, the, the badger one is brilliant. Okay, badger, that's <laughs> right there. And then the, what else? We have species of coyote well, what is the species it's like I, I, I'm just you know, there's koi dog there's some other prehistoric one the, now you've heard of the Shunka Warakin no Lauren Coleman the aforementioned author the cryptozoologist guy well he's not a cryptozoologist is he he's just a researcher 
into cryptids, right? Mm -hmm. He's not actually trained in zoology. Yeah, or it anything. sounded like he was actually pals with Keel as well. Oh, okay. When um, Keel couldn't make it to the Mothman uh, unveiling of the statue in Point Pleasant, uh, he was the one that went. Oh, okay. Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark, they suggested that this there's a creature called the Shunkawarakin that was supposed to have lived in the upper Midwest, and the Native Americans knew of it, and the early settlers. And um, it was named by the Iowa Indians, and it's meant it its name literally meant carrying off dogs. Little is known about it, but apparently it was fierce, and a mounted specimen was exhibited at various times in the West Yellowstone area in a small museum near Henry Lake in Idaho. Supposedly, the dog, hyena-ish creature, fits many of the descriptions of witnesses in southeastern Wisconsin, including its strange look. Um, its dark, shaggy fur and sloping weakness to its back legs was noted in every report, so they're saying it could have been this thing. But to me, this thing, Shunka Warakin, sounds like one of those early days circus sideshow, uh, phony baloney, manufactured carcasses where they like they have a taxidermist, you know, throw together some different animals. It sounded to me like that that maybe what it, what that's maybe what this the Shunka Warakin was. But uh, again, nah, not buying that as an explanation for the Beast of Bray Road. I'm also not believing that it's any species of bear. The physical description's totally wrong. Yeah, although a lot of people, a lot of skeptics try to, to say that these people that have lived out there forever have no idea what a bear looks like. Uh, Even though bears are really rare. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, the, the again, the Shunka Warakin, um, where's the body now? If this was a real animal. Uh... I'm not buying it. So we're not buying it's a bear. I mean, it doesn't look anything like a bear. We have bears here. We have bears in the northwest area. And trust me, <laughs> this wasn't a bear. This wasn't a raccoon. This wasn't a coyote. This wasn't this highly questionable sideshow thing from the 1880s. Um, and now the other explanation is that it was a hoax. Which... With the I'm so on the fence on that. I think yeah. that the, the number of people that all knew each other during the 89-92 flap is a little bit questionable. And the film stuff is just the infuriating. Film is the film is crap, but that has no connection to the witnesses. Yeah, the, the one the one saving grace of this is that Steve Kruger, Kruger, it's got to be Kruger. What an awesome name. I know. Nightmare on Bray Road. We have these medical students, and, and, and if anyone's not a stupid hillbilly, it's a medical student. And they're not related. There are witnesses who aren't in any way related to these this core of people who yeah. are interconnected, you know, though. There's also the skeptics, one of their old favorites, the uh, mass hysteria. I don't understand what uh, medical students hoping to make careers as doctors are going to get by being, comp you know, telling stories that are going to have them completely mocked and ridiculed for the rest of their lives. Exactly. Nor do I understand why the pub, the county public humane officer would be interested in pointing people to, you know, houses where occult activity took place, or why this other, the, uh, the roadkill cleanup dude would, you know, pretty much risk his public career by, by whipping up a story like this. I mean, he knew he was going to get ridiculed and he still felt obligated to, to say something. Yeah, I mean, you're a guy who cleans up roadkill for a little... You wouldn't even think you would want the public to know what you do. Let alone, not only know what you do, but know that you saw a friggin' werewolf stealing stuff out of your truck. I mean, it's like saying, I'm a dishwasher at Denny's, and Bigfoot came in and, like, broke all my dishes, and that's why I didn't finish my shift or whatever. I mean, it's just... Why would you want to be a famous dishwasher? You have got to be thinking, what was this guy drinking on the job? Exactly. Yeah, it's it's it, that doesn't add up. But yeah, there is a lot of interconnectivity. But then again, there's a lot of interconnectivity in all small towns. Yeah, yeah that is true. And and I did like what uh, uh, Linda Godfrey said about the people at the center of it happened to be bus drivers that heard a lot of stories from kids, so which they, they may have just picked up on it. Yeah, which they would. And so, but again, I want to get back on this mass hysteria. 
isn't is the definition of mass hysteria like a group hallucination? Is that because that's what I was thinking they mean by mass hysteria, or is it just that people get worked up and then they all start imagining? Things? It's it's from the War of the Worlds broadcast. Okay, okay. Mass hysteria is a real thing, as far as people getting worked up and then all getting in, into hysterics and then believing something that isn't true, like the War of the Worlds broadcast did, but. Witnesses giving detailed accounts of something isn't the same thing as mass hysteria, in my opinion. I mean, these were people who weren't in hysterics. They're like people going about their everyday business, and then they see something. It just doesn't sound like mass hysteria to me. Well, I, I don't know. I think skeptics pull that one out a little bit too uh, liberally. Oh, yeah. Well, they, they pull out a lot of things too liberally. Cause now that the badger, I oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's just... I mean, it's obvious that they're grasping at straws to keep things in a neat little box that they can explain. And when they can't, they, 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 just, they just do these ridiculous mental gymnastics. And these are often intelligent people. Like James Randi, for instance. He's not stupid. I mean, I'm sure he's far... He's more intelligent than me, but he's... It's just... It, it, it seems to be an ego or, or just a, fl a flat-out fear of the unknown that drives them to the point where they, they just have to to stretch reality in order to avoid anything that they can't explain and it's just I find it annoying yeah I'm with you on that I don't see the motivation for all these people because again it's much like Mothman they're not gaining anything but getting laughed at okay so what about some of the fantastic explanations what do you think the possibility of it being a werewolf is now that that's what I wanted to get into was the whole the whole origin of werewolves themselves like this this stuff's been in lo in 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 folklore for what is it thousands of years or at least many well, hundreds at least hundreds i mean the earliest stuff i know about is like medieval dark ages yeah that's what that's true like too france and england so it's it's many hundreds of years at least we've had and in, in american indian lore there there are lycanthropes which is a greek word actually it's not an american indian word, yeah but... they call them skin changers or skin walkers right men that could transform and that wasn't just wolves it was actually in, into other animals but there were a lot of Middle Ages. There was a lot of you know hysteria and ignorance in the Middle Ages. We all know that, and witch hunts and all that. But yeah, some of the creepiest drawings of werewolves come from the Dark Ages, though. Yeah, but the fact that the sightings look just like those is a mm -hmm. little bit creepy. Hey, there's also this French guy, uh, Giles Arandou, that drew a picture of a wolf on its knees. I'm sure you got that name wrong, but I'm not going to correct you. He drew a picture of a wolf creature on its knees eating a uh, uh, creature, eating, you know, some animal. And it's basically something he saw in France at about the same time all this fun stuff was happening in Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. That was the one. It was wearing a, a beret and it was eating a baguette, wasn't it? <laughs> and it had, like, mime makeup on. <laughs> Werewolf sightings they in France. They get out of an invisible box. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, they, they saw this thing hunched over on the side of the road, putting its hands in the air like it was in a box. <laughs> uh, actually, that's much more terrifying than I did. <laughs> the wear mime. <laughs> no way, you're not funny. No, stop haunting me. <laughs> the wear mime. I'll be honest, I'm highly skeptical of the werewolf thing. Uh, well, okay, as far as the traditional, um, what, man makes a pact with Satan, or, or a man has cursed? No, 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 just the what? whole transforming from one creature to another. I mean, the amount of calories that would be needed to do that. I mean, aside from the physical, just, like, absolute impossibility of it. There, there's a lot of fast just, food in Wisconsin, it. though. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of Wendy's and Burger Kings in Wisconsin. <laughs> So you, you believe it's fantastic, but do you think it's possible? I'd have to say at this point, I, I don't believe it's possible. I mean, yeah, I, I'm completely of the not even plausible. I mean, it's... creatures traveling through other dimensions, I might be able to buy, but man changing into a wolf, no. Yeah, yeah. What I was gonna say is, I, I yeah, I do not believe this is some guy turning into a wolf who, you know at dawn turns back into a man naked in some field and like scurries home and you know he doesn't know where he was the night before at balloons from my passing child yeah <laughs> cue yakety sex uh no I, I don't believe that at all but I do think that this this paranormal this interdimensional 
yeah, entity no, once, once intelligence. Once again, we get back to the whole weird Mothman, like, you know, maybe there's something that causes people to perceive it in different ways. It's just interesting that it keeps morphing, you know, the way people perceive it. So it's Mothman in one area and a Wolfman in another. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's too many similarities. Did, we had animal mutilations, did, but we didn't have half-eaten carcasses, though, in, in, in Point Pleasant during the Mothman flap. We didn't have... There were mutilations, though, right, that looked like they were possibly cult-related. There, there were animal mutilations. I don't recall if any were eaten, though. That doesn't stand out to me. I don't think there were. There were missing, a couple of missing ones. Yeah. There, but there, the occult thing is what gets me intrigued, is that there seems to be some occult activity in both towns during this flap. And there's got to be a connection. Or, I mean, it seems like there's a connection. Like, that somehow the activities of these devilish cults are bringing forth evil energy that manifests in the area in the form of whatever. I, I don't know. I mean, again, you have tangible evil sensed by witnesses. I mean, this is not a friendly, cuddly creature here. And it... And then it's just... It's, it's, it's confusing. I don't know. There's things about it that seem paraphysical, and yet it has physical traces, you know? But then again, it never actually harms anybody. It, like, chases right. after them a little bit, but then always stops short of, like, doing the actual deed. Right, which to me is showing some kind of supernatural barrier of something. Like, it's not really allowed to physically interact with human beings, because Mothman didn't either. It got dang close. But then there but are reports did. of ghosts that leave scratches on people. That's true. I know. And I've seen, I've seen, that's for another show, but I've seen videos of, of people where scratches are actually appearing live on camera. Yeah, yeah. No, I've this seen the real. same thing. Yeah, this it's is creepy. real. So I really don't know. We're just going to have to put that in the totally unknown file. But there, so, The it, Beast of Bray Road, I have to agree, totally unknown file. Although I would love to see somebody investigate the uh, weird humane officers that showed up and started asking people for animals. See, again, that's so Men in Black. Yeah, oh, totally. But they're not doing the typical Men in Black agenda where they're threatening people not to talk about the Bray Wolf. They're just asking for animals are looking for animals, which is kind of weird. Like, maybe... Well, remember, Keel thinks that there may be a biological component needed for this thing to manifest. Which goes back to, again, blood. Genetic matter. I, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know enough. And no, I don't obviously know what he does. But it's fun to speculate. And that's what this show is all about. If nothing else, stimulating the imagination and getting you to think outside the box at least for an hour in your life in your everyday life to ponder what else is going on outside your cubicle living room or wherever you spend most of your time in your mom's basement <laughs> wherever word <laughs> word we are keeping it real <laughs> we will leave you with that yet another unexplainable event in this bizarre realm of the unconventional. How's that for a tie up there? How's that for a little Yeah, that was nice. I liked that. It's like Rod Serkis. For now, our journey has ended, and we return you to the world of the mundane. Until next time, when we beckon you once again from beyond the veil into the realm of the unconventional. unconventional.